I think the best way to uh, introduce uh, the speaker is to give you a, a very brief uh, thumbnail sketch of her biography so that you can fit in her own uh, the, the selections from her memoir, from her, which is a kind of autobiographical memoir, uh, into the framework of her life. She was born in the fall of 1931 in Vienna, Austria. She lived there uh, for the next 11 years. When she was six years old, the year she started school, uh, or actually shortly after she started school in 1937, uh, Nazi Germany annexed Austria and Hitler basically took over Austria in the spring of 1938. So very soon after beginning uh, public school in, in Vienna, uh, Ruth Kluger was subjected to the anti-Semitic laws and uh, street violence that the uh, Nazis, that the Germans brought with them into Austria. Uh, very soon, special schools were set up for Jewish children. Uh, Jewish children were, at that time, already emigrating and force, being forced uh, to leave the country, and the schools were consolidated at a, at a rapid rate, the Jewish schools, and she had to switch schools, I believe, eight times uh, in, uh, in those few years that she was allowed to attend school in, uh, in German Austria. Uh, her father was forced to leave the country in 1939. She herself remained there with her mother until 1942. Um, one event I'd like to highlight out of uh, Ruth Kluger's uh, school years is her choice of her own name. Her name had been Susie, but she chose in this Odys Odyssey through Jewish schools the explicitly Jewish name of Ruth to use as her own to uh, sort of turn around and say, I am Jewish, and make that open and manifest. I think that's uh, a very self-confident act of opposition uh, at the time for a, a fairly young uh, child. Uh, in 1942, she and her mother were taken forcibly to the Theresienstadt camp, which is uh, in what is now Czechoslovakia. It's not far from Prague. It's a very special kind of concentration camp. It was known as a family camp. The conditions there were somewhat better than at uh, most of the concentration and extermination camps that we know. Uh, her grandmother was there as well in a special infirmary barrack. So she was allowed to live there with her mother, and uh, there was some kind of cultural life in the very dire circumstances there. Um, so just. Uh, for that setting. She was in uh, Theresienstadt from uh, September 1942 until May of 1944. Uh, so a little bit less than two years. And from there, from Theresienstadt, there was basically the only way to get out of Theresienstadt was to go to Auschwitz. There were trains leaving regularly from there for Auschwitz. And uh, soon after arrival in Auschwitz, um, people were selected out. In particular, there were selections from the so-called family camp at uh, Theresienstadt. Uh, at one of those selections, uh, Ruth was at that time 12 years old, um, and the people who were being selected out to go on and, and work in uh, German labor camps had to be, be at least 15 years old. So she went through the line once uh, and ignored her mother's advice to say that she was 15. She found that preposterous as a 12-year-old to claim uh, to be that old. And then uh, she was actually able to get out of line and go through the line again. And uh, the prisoner functionary who was uh, registering names at the beginning of the line told her again and emphasized her mother's advice um, to say she was 15, and she actually did, and, uh, and was selected out uh, to go to work instead of to the gas chambers right away. So it's, a, uh, as you can imagine, a very harrowing experience for a 12-year-old. Uh, then begins her odyssey uh, to another German labor camp, Gross Rosen, uh, in a rural area of Poland where she does hard labor, uh, forestry work, things like cutting down trees and laying train tracks. Uh, in the chaos at the end of the war, in the winter of 1945, she and her mother are able to escape uh, basically go underground, uh, someone helps them to obtain German papers, and they're able to live um, undercover until the end of the war. After the end of the war in southern Germany, she's able to uh, um, go to a kind of makeshift high school and obtain what they call an emergency high school diploma, which enables her to go to university in Germany. So she begins university studies uh, in Germany in uh, in. 
I guess it's 1946, 47. Um, they, soon thereafter, she and her mother, and actually one of the things that her mother did was to adopt, I put it in, uh, in scare quotes, uh, another child who had come with them from Theresienstadt who did not have uh, parents of her own. And she and her uh, adopted sister and her mother then emigrate to the United States, to New York in 1947. Uh, she attended Hunter College, received a BA in English at age 18 in 1950. Um, she went on to get an MA in uh, English Literature at Berkeley. She married and had two sons in the 1950s. And, um, and then uh, when she wanted to um, go back and, and um, um, into uh, a career, she uh, started studying again and obtained a PhD about uh, Baroque poetry in 1967. Thereafter, um, she teaches at a string of uh, universities in the United States, including the University of Kansas, the University of Virginia, Princeton, and uh, finally the University of California at Irvine, uh, where she is now in emerita. Um, Ruth Kluger is known today uh, for her feminist literary criticism, um, which she began writing in the 1970s. Um, she has several uh, works uh, about German literature, collections of essays, uh, one of which is entitled Women Read Differently in 1996. Um, the book that we're going to hear her read from this evening is entitled Still Alive, A Holocaust Girlhood Remembered. It just came out in English last year, but it was written uh, as a consequence of her staying uh, of her uh, work as the director of the Education Abroad program that UC runs in Göttingen. And after she had been there about a year, um, and the, there was a, a bicycle accident about which she writes, and that prompted her to begin to write about her experiences and to investigate more deeply her relationship to Germany and, um, and her past um, experiences with the uh, Germans. Uh, that memoir appeared in Germany in 1992 in a very small publishing house. It was difficult for her at that time to find a publisher. Uh, but it soon became, soon rose to the top of several of the bestseller lists in Germany. And, um, and it's just had remarkable success. It's an amazing book. It's been translated into at least 10 languages. Uh, the work and uh, Ruth Kluger for her uh, her other work as well have won quite a number of prizes, including the Heinrich Heine Prize, the Grimmelshausen Prize, the uh, Prix Memoir de la Shoah, the Thomas Mann Prize of the city of Lübeck, and an Austrian National Prize for Literary Criticism. So it's a, a widely renowned work. Uh, Ruth waited. Uh, a lot of what she writes about uh, has to do with her experience and her relationship to her mother. And um, out of deference to her mother, she waited to published the English edition until after her mother's death. Um, so that's one of the reasons that the English version came out so much later than the German version. I'd like to uh, conclude my introduction with a very short personal remark that I think highlights what makes this memoir so very special. Because as you know, there are many, many memoirs about the Holocaust. I teach German history, and in particular, how the Germans study about, learn about, teach about, the Holocaust and the Nazi period. And I've been doing research on this for, oh, about 20 years. And uh, in 1993, in the summer, I was back in Germany doing research and staying with a friend of mine in Munich and commuting out to Dachau on the train. And my friend said, Harold, you've got to read this book. And she gave me a copy of the, the German version, Weiter Leben. And I read it, and I literally couldn't put it down. I read it on the, uh, the S-Bahn, the German uh, commuter train, and I read it that, and I think I was finished with it with, uh, in about a day and a half at that time. It was just an amazing memoir. And what made it so special is that Ruth Kluger goes into dialogue with young Germans, and she doesn't have uh, any, there aren't any taboos for her. She, she goes right to the heart of the matter, and she's very open about herself about her relationship to her mother, about her thoughts about uh, Germany, the, what has become known as the Shoah industry or the, the Shoah business or the Holocaust industry, um, our own relationship and fascination with the history of the Holocaust. 
And I think this is a memoir for the coming generations, whereas many of the best known memoirs of the Holocaust were written decades ago and were for past generations. This one, I think, opens up a dialogue with us here today. And with that said, I'd like to invite Ruth Kluger up uh, to read from her novel. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for this very kind and uh, uh, concise introduction to uh, what I've written and who I am. Uh, you're, you're, you're quite right about um, uh, what you said last, not that this is a fascinating book, but, uh, 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 but that it is a book that um, uh, tries to take into account wh uh, what we are today and not only what happened in the past. That is, I try in this book to uh, to write not only about the events, but about the filter of memory. And so the way in which, which this is written uh, is uh, that I tell a story, but I keep interrupting the story with reflections and uh, references to, uh, to today, or to the person I've since become. As you've heard, I was born in Vienna in 1931. Jewish parents are not something that uh, one would recommend to anybody, but people don't choose their birthplace and their birth year. Uh, so I will, in order to illustrate what I just said, I'm going to start at the um, beginning, but I will not only read from the beginning. I'm going to read several sections from different parts of the book. Their secret was death, not sex. That's what the grown-ups were talking about, sitting up late around the table. I had pretended that I couldn't fall asleep in my bed and begged them to let me sleep on the sofa in the living room. Of course, I didn't intend to fall asleep. I wanted to get in on the forbidden news, the horror stories, fascinating though incomplete as they always were. Or perhaps even more fascinating for their opaqueness, the whiff of fantasy they had about them, the one knew they were true. Some were about strangers, others were about relatives, all were about Jews. At the table there was talk of Hans, a younger cousin of my mother's whom they had held temporarily in Buchenwald. The name means beech grove, a pretty name, the kind I liked because I read poetry about nature. The voices at the table, women's voices, indistinct and barely audible because I kept my head under the blanket, were saying KZ, just the two letters, short for Konzentrationslager, concentration camp. In German, they make an ugly sound. They spit and cough like Kat said. Hans was scared. They had bullied him into not talking, and he hadn't talked, or perhaps he had, maybe just to his mother. They had tortured him. What is torture? How does one stand it? How is it done? But he was alive and back, knock on wood. Let's be thankful. Next question, how do we get him out of Austria? Hans did get out, and I was to meet him again in England when I was no longer eight years old, but the way I'm now, impatient and absent-minded, prone to drop things intentionally or through clumsiness, even breakables like dishes and love affairs. A woman who's perennially on the move, changing jobs and homes at the drop of her hat. Uh, uh, Mr. Mark Hughes mentioned all, all these jobs that I've had and, and left. That's, this has a deeper reason, I'm sure. So moving jobs and homes at the drop of her hat and inventing the reasons afterwards while she's packing. A person who runs away as soon as she gets nervous, long before she smells danger. Because running away was the best thing I ever did, ever do. You feel alive when you run away. It's the ultimate drug in my experience. So there I was with Hans in England in his home, which he loved because he owned it. Uh, he was married to an English woman, a Gentile, and his children were visiting. I had come from America together with Heinz, another cousin on my mother's side, who had survived the war in Hungary with false papers that declared him an Aryan and a Catholic. Heinz was lucky in that his over-anxious mother had refused to have him circumcised, a fact that caused considerable embarrassment when he was a little boy playing on the beach in the nude, as was customary in Europe. Put some pants on him, my grandfather, though no prude, would say to his older daughter, my aunt, writhing in his beach chair with discomfort at the sight of the shameful piece of skin, a babyish indiscretion disgracing the Jewish family. Nowadays, Heinz assures me that that bit of skin came in handy in the Hungarian school lavatories and locker rooms. 
When Heinz's grandmother died in Budapest during the war, the family had to drag the Catholic priest away from the door of her room, for she would have vehemently rejected his promise of eternal life, and thereby would have endangered the earthly life of the others. Meanwhile, our English cousin Hans, who had ended up liberating his homeland Austria as a soldier in the British Army and surprising natives with his ability to curse in perfect Viennese, um, was offering us uh, tea and cakes, and I was shifting in my seat, eager to get up, do something, go for a walk, anything to escape the all-embracing envelope of boredom, the unrelenting regurgitation of details from everyday life. Heinz told me later, Heinz is the American, uh, not without a touch of malice, that Hans had asked him if I suffered from hemorrhoids since I wouldn't sit still for long. But Hans wasn't your average English homeowner. He had been tortured in Buchenwald when he was a teenager. And I was the little relative who kept her ears open under her blanket, determined to find out more about this extraordinary experience. Not so much from sympathy as from curiosity, because Hans was the center of an exciting mystery which concerned me too, in some nebulous way. Though no one would tell me about it because I was too young. And now? Now I was better informed and could ask all I liked, for those who had imposed the restriction were gone, dispersed, had died in gas chambers or in their beds, wherever. And still I cannot get rid of the prickly sense that I'm breaking taboos, searching for indecencies like Noah's children uncovering their father's nakedness, that I'm not supposed to know about death and dying, as if there were anything else worth knowing. The grown-ups pretended that only grown-ups die. But on the street, for all to hear, the Nazi boys were singing the song about Jewish blood spurting from their knives. That included my blood, didn't it? And they were carrying sharp little daggers, weren't they? You didn't have to be very smart to get their meaning. On the contrary, it required some mental agility to ignore it, to shrug it off. A German colleague of mine, I've become a professor of German since, reads what I've just written and says, you know, those knives were not daggers. They weren't even pointed. He takes a pencil and painstakingly draws the kind of knife he used to own as a member of the Hitler Youth. I would have preferred a real weapon, he reminisces, then adds, our knives carried the, blood, uh, carried the legend, blood and honor. That's a dagger for sure, I think. Blood and honor means a dagger whether the knife is pointed or round. Uh, so you see, it sort of uh, goes back and forth a bit. Um, I'm skipping now. This was my first experience from, uh, uh, in school, uh, uh, in first grade. Uh, we were meant to become good, patriotic little Austrians. And so in first grade, we learned a song celebrating the martyrdom of Chancellor Dollfuss, who had preceded the present chancellor uh, and who had been murdered by a Nazi, one fascist in effect killing another fascist. The song had a very short life, since in March of my first school year, we were invaded. A happy-making event to a large portion of the citizenry. The school principal came to our class, told us that we now had to use the Hitler greeting, and raised his right arm to show us how it was done. Only the Jewish children were not to use it. The class dutifully imitated him, while we, five or six Jewish kids, got to sit in back. Because the principal was friendly and the teacher visibly embarrassed, I was unsure at first, such is the touching optimism of the young, whether our special status was a privilege or an insult. After all, the grown-ups knew that Austria had been unjustly overpowered, and surely not all of them were Nazis. In arts and crafts class, the other girls learned how to cut and glue swastikas from colored paper. The Jewish girls were allowed to cut and paste what they liked, which was and wasn't like free playtime. One tried to enjoy it, but one didn't. On and off, Aryan girls would come over and let us admire their handiwork. They asked us, to criticize and compare. It was only reasonable that the state of things couldn't continue. We were thrown out of school and went to a new one just for Jewish children. I've heard a Jewish woman who's about my age tell how she first experienced the Nazis in Vienna. It was the sandbox, she says. 
She was playing in the sandbox, and one of the alien mothers simply threw her out. She thought at first it was a new game and promptly piled back in. The game was repeated. After the third time, she understood. Jewish children are notoriously good learners. But what, I wonder, went on in the head of the woman who did this? And yet, being thrown out of our sandbox for no apparent reason by the parents of the other kids, that was the quintessential experience of my generation of preschoolers and first graders in Hitler's Vienna. Uh, I shall skip um, to the end of this Vienna chapter. After the war, my mother and I went back to Vienna for a couple of weeks to see what was left of our relatives, of our property. It was like entering the original slime or perhaps cesspool from which life developed. I was surprised that the city was still there at all, for I, for I had left it so far behind. The Russian occupation forces were everywhere, and people told horror stories about them, about the Russians. Women in particular tried to avoid them, but I didn't fear them, though they probably deserved to be feared, because by this time I didn't scare easily. There was a joke current in post-war Vienna about two people to whom Jews had entrusted their things before deportation. One says to the other, you're lucky, your Jew didn't return, mine did. I didn't want to own anything, since I didn't understand that having more translates into living better. That had not been my experience. We had been middle class, and what good had it done us? I just wanted out and not to have to turn back. Vienna was awash in self-pity. I was unmoved and noticed that the city was not nearly as devastated as the Munich from which I had just come. Everyone felt they had been victims of the Nazis, whereas to me, they had been the arch-Nazis. Statistics bear me out. Percentage-wise, more Austrians than Germans were involved in the more gruesome tasks performed by the Nazis, guarding concentration camps, for example. Only the language was what it had always been, the speech of my childhood with its, with its peculiar inflections and rhythms, a sense of humor the Germans often don't get, and a wealth of malicious half-tones that would be obscene in any other tongue. Also an intense lyricism that easily degenerates into kitsch. I understand this language, but I don't like it. I speak it, but I wouldn't have chosen it. I'm hooked on it, and it's the reason I go back for visits though I have no relatives or friends of relatives, only a few new friends, writers, feminists, socialists, who sit in cafes and argue. I get depressed after a while and clutch my American passport, eyeing the taxis that will take me to the train station or the airport. But it is the city where I learn to speak, listen, and read, all the basics for a human life. I remain its reluctant child. The trouble is that it was a city that hated children, Jewish children to be precise. Well, as you heard, my mother and I were deported to this peculiar camp, Theresienstadt, which was called a ghetto at the time, but is now classified as a, uh, as a concentration camp. Um, and in Theresienstadt, I um, lived with... Uh, in, in, in a youth home that is the, the Jewish administration of the Nazis who did the work for them, um, managed to uh, concentrate the children in certain houses. Uh, I mean, only the children who wanted to, to live there. And so I was together with children, which I hadn't been for a long time in, in Vienna, where in the end I was very isolated. And. Um, Okay. In August 1943, a group of children came to Theresienstadt. I didn't see them and hardly anyone did. They were supposed to continue on a special transport to Switzerland or to some other foreign country. And only a few caretakers, um, only a few caretakers were permitted to interact with them during their short stay in the ghetto. In spite of their isolation, a rumor circulated that these children went into a panic when they were to take a shower and the reason for their refusal. The grown-ups thought, or at least said, that the story about showers that dispensed poison gas instead of water was a product of the children's fertile imagination. 
But children like myself took it seriously. Why not? Children are still learning how the world works. So that was it. I began to see my Jewish surroundings as an unreliable cushion against the uniformed men's universe outside running its obscene and secretive business, which one couldn't talk about because it turned into pornography in your mouth and was therefore a taboo subject. I tried to find out more about this children's transport. It's not difficult. Everything is documented. But there's an itch, a discomfort, as if I'm doing something that is improper, not kosher, as if I cared about kosher and proper, like uncovering a sacrament or its opposite. Is there still a ban of silence governing the fate of these children? I read that they came from Poland, from Bialystok to be precise, where the Jews knew about the Nazi methods of extermination, and that they were sent on in October with 53 Jewish caretakers, all assuming that they were traveling to, sa to a safe haven. But the journey was to Auschwitz and death. Among these caretakers was Kafka's favorite sister, Otla, not famous yet, for her late brother's books hadn't become the most widely read German works in the world. Her 60th birthday, uh, I'm sorry, his, his Kafka's 60th birthday had been celebrated in Theresien, started that very summer, and she had participated. The ghetto believed in culture. In a way, I loved Theresienstadt. For the 19 or 20 months which I spent there made me into a social animal. Vienna had treated me as an outcast. It had made me into an eccentric oddball of a child who had no idea how to be a team player. In Vienna, I suffered from neurotic compulsions and had tics. In Theresienstadt, I overcame my obsessions by means of human contacts, friendships, and conversation. It's amazing how talkative we become when we have nothing but our tongues to distract us from our misery. Though, of course, the misery must be halfway bearable. The German wife of a colleague tells me, Theresienstadt wasn't all that bad, was it now? And in a way, she is right. Uh, but where did she get off lecturing me on this place from my past, where everything that came from the Germans was pure malice, and the good had its only source in us, the prisoners? whose voices are still lodged in my brain, they had to be strangled to silence them, and blessed be their memory. Most of what I know about living with others, I learned from the young socialists and Zionists who took care of the children in Theresienstadt, looking after them until they had to deliver them up to destruction and were themselves destroyed. Where there wasn't enough of anything, and only the limitations imposed on us had no limit. To call that not so bad. The only good was what the Jews managed to make of it, the way they flooded the square kilometer of Czech soil with their voices, their intellect, their wit, their playfulness, their joy in dialogue. The good emanated from our sense of self. And I learned for the first time who we were, what we could be, these people to whom I belonged, or had to belong according to our oppressors, and now wanted to belong. When I ask myself today how and why an unbeliever like me can call herself a Jew, one of several possible answers runs, it's because of Theresienstadt. That is where I became a Jew. And I hated Theresienstadt. It was a mud hole, a cesspool, a sty where you couldn't stretch without touching someone, an ant heap under destructive feet. If I'm introduced to someone who has spent time in Theresienstadt, I'm ashamed of our common fate and immediately tell him or her that I didn't last there to the war's end. Then I break off the conversation in order to prevent any gestures of chumminess. Who wants to have been an ant? Life in the big stable. The owners occasionally show up in their ominous uniforms to make sure that the cattle behave makes you feel like the scum of the earth, which is exactly what we were. To belong to a powerless people who are either arrogant or self-critical to the point of self-hatred, to know no language other than what those who thought the subhuman spoke, to have no opportunity to learn another language, to learn anything, all energy and enterprise drained away, an ever more impoverished, limited life, like treading water, waiting for time to pass, and getting older, having to stay there. Decades later, I sat in an automobile driving out of Theresienstadt, and it was like a bitter euphoria, if I may be allowed the oxymoron, that belated fulfillment of a childhood dream. For Theresienstadt proved a magnet. Hadn't I grown up there? 
Long after the end of the war, I went back, an American tourist in a communist country, walking the streets of a small Czech town. It seemed nearly empty, and it had been so crowded. I went to the building where we had lived and knocked on the door. The woman who opened understood right away that I wanted to see the room where I had camped with 30 other girls. It was now her living room, and it was rather smaller than my American living room. And I went up to the attic where I had heard the young Zionists and the old rabbi back from Berlin. And I thought he must have talked to us on Rosh Hashanah, since he talked about the creation of the world, which is what the Jewish New Year is about. Then I went for a walk and watched the children play on the street. I saw my ghosts among them, clearly outlined and recognizable, like silent silhouettes, while the living children were solid and loud. I was at peace when I left. I had not been to a museum. I had seen a re-established normality, as comfortable and commonplace as the human habitat should be. Well, as you heard, after that we were transported to Auschwitz. Hunger was less of a problem than thirst. Those who have never been thirsty repeatedly or for a long or have never been thirsty repeatedly or for a long time are apt to have more sympathy for the starving. But you only have to consider how long it takes for a person to die of hunger and how quickly he dies of thirst. You can live for weeks, even months, without food, but you die of thirst within days. Accordingly, thirst is more nagging, harder to put up with than hunger. In Birkenau, that was the uh, uh, extermination part of Auschwitz. Uh, our food, our daily nondescript soup, must have been very salty for I was always thirsty, especially during the hot hour-long roll calls in the sun. What did you children do in Auschwitz, someone asked me recently. Did you play games? Games indeed. No, we had roll call instead. In Auschwitz I stood in rows of five and was thirsty and afraid of dying. That's it. That's all. That's the sum of it. Central Europeans in Birkenau. There was a woman high school teacher who shortly after her arrival, in the face of the smoking, flaming crematoria, lectured us with touching conviction on how the obvious wasn't possible, for this was the 20th century and we were in Europe, that is at the heart of the civilized world. And how, I recall how ridiculous she seemed to me. Not because she didn't believe in genocide, that refusal was comprehensible. For this business wasn't plausible, why kill all the Jews? And every objection was welcome to my 12-year-old love of life or fear of death. But her reasons were ridiculous. The bit about culture in the heart of Europe. I too liked culture, what little of it had been accessible to me through books, but I didn't believe that it compellingly mandated a certain line of conduct. Put differently, I had no reason to believe that culture meant community. Today, every, everyone recognizes the phrase over the gate of Auschwitz, Arbeit macht frei, labor liberates, as the ultimate motto of a murderer's irony. There were other proverbs written in large capital letters on the cross beams of our barracks. I used to stare in cold desperation at the nonsensical speech is silver, silence is gold, and in utter disbelief at live and let live. An earlier transport, which had been wiped out, had had the task of decorating our living quarters. I looked at these pearls of wisdom every day, revolted by their absolute claim to truth, which in the face of reality, in which, uh, of the reality in which they were inscribed, exposed them as absolute lies. German proverbs nauseate me. I can't hear any of them without seeing its cynical application in the death factory. Sketches from Birkenau, a school teacher whom I remember with some emotion but no respect. He would collect stalks of grass, of which there wasn't much, but he found what there was and patiently identified the grasses by their various names, commenting, you see, even here in Auschwitz, something can grow. There is life. But for me, there was no comfort in the thought that the grass would outlast me. 
Second sketch, two men are fighting in front of a barracks. One of them says, what are you yelling about? No point getting excited. The chimney burns the same for you as for me. He's not resigned, he's angry, he shouts. And yet the gas chambers were the subject of everyday banter. There were discussions about whether it was technically possible to cremate as many people as rumor had it. The optimists thought that the crematoria, the chimney, took care only of those who had died of more or less natural causes chit-chat about one's own prospective slaughter. D-Day, the news reached us in Auschwitz. The Americans had landed in Normandy, Normandy, wherever that might be, but it was somewhere in Europe. They'd come out of the water in the air. In Auschwitz, there was never enough water for me, and there was soot in the air. They'd waded out of the ocean and leaped out of their airplanes. I imagined them landing. Now it can't last much longer. Later, I was married for some years to one of those paratroopers and probably chose him mainly because he had jumped out of the clouds and into the legendary land of Normandy during the leaden summer of 1944 to liberate me. My mother carries soup. The enormous barrel is suspended between two poles. Altogether, four women carry it, two in front, two behind. The weight is too much for my mother. I'm stunned to see her this way, her face red and her veins protrude protruding. She must have volunteered for the extra bowl of soup. For me, I don't want that. Don't do this to me. Two old women arguing. They stand in the glaring sun, gesticulating with emaciated fingers. A third woman joins them, a prisoner with some authority, and knocks their heads against each other, hard. The brutality of the scene strikes me with full force, a sensation of deep terror. I'm witnessing the dissolution I'm witnessing the dissolution of the social structure which I had known at least sketchily. Later, I used to think this horror was a little naive. There was so much that was worse. But still later, I came around to thinking that I was not simple-minded and that my reaction was right as rain. Old women in Auschwitz, their nakedness and helplessness, the needs of the old people, their exposure old women on the mass latrines, where at least a dozen women at the time were dealing with their constipation or diarrhea in full view of each other. The old don't take physical functions for granted as children and young women do, especially the generation I have in mind, that of my grandmother, who had been born in the 19th century with its rigid standards of modesty. It was the time of the transports from Hungary. The camp next to ours was suddenly full of Hungarian women. They'd come directly from home and were uninformed. We talked to them through the barbed wire in fast, hectic sentences without telling them much. I noticed how far ahead of them I was with my experience of Theresienstadt. There was a woman who spoke excellent German and her daughter, uh, uh, with her daughter about my age. It was evening. Both of them were cold, though the days were very warm. My mother identified right away with this other mother who worried about the whereabouts of her husband and her son. They had been separated at the ramp, at the arrival, she said. My mother remembered that she still had a pair of woolen socks when to fetch, fetch them and prepare to toss them over the wire. I interfered. I can throw better than you. Give them to me. My mother refused through the socks and they fell short, ending up stuck on top of the wire where no one could reach them. Regrets on both sides, a futile gesture. Next day, the Hungarian women were gone, their camp empty like a ghost town, our socks still impaled on the wire. Well, uh, Professor Mark Hughes has told us how I, I told you how, how I got out of Auschwitz. Very unlikely, I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm one of the very youngest people who ever uh, made it out of that camp, other than the the twins, the twins which Dr. Mengele used for his experiments, they, they are even younger. But the 12 year old had actually no chance to get out of Birkenau. So this is, um, this is now the end, towards the end of, um, towards the end of the war. And we are in this uh, forced labor camp. 
The first weeks of 1945, and by now there was so little to eat that you couldn't think of anything but food. When I got my daily bread ration, I stuffed it into my mouth as if I had to swallow it all in one swoop. Once in a great while I saw myself as I must have looked to an outside and was ashamed. As the food supply decreased, the social differences between the prisoners increased. Economic class distinctions like everywhere else. The cooks and their children grew fat, actually fat. The less there was to eat, the more eagerly the keepers of the food ate it. Since they cooked not only for us, but also for the guards, they had access to wherever there was and they helped themselves. When the winter clothes came, used stuff that had belonged to the dead, the cooks chose first and took what was best. I'm standing in front of the central building and there is light in the kitchen so I can look in the window. A cook shows off her plump daughter to another woman who's wearing worthless rags. She shows the rag woman what a good skirt her daughter is wearing and the daughter preens and poses as if this were a fashion show. Rag woman admires kitchen daughter in her new second hand get up because she's hoping for food for a second helping. January 1945, we could hear the Russian gunfire approaching as every day the front moved closer. The menacing noise was sweet music to us. We didn't have to work anymore. We starved, froze, and waited. Reprieve from hard labor was a blessing, but we paid for it by getting less and less food. During roll call, an SS man yelled, an SS man yelled, don't imagine that Roosevelt will help you, which led me to conclude that American help was indeed imminent. Prisoners from other camps, which were gradually being evacuated, showed up at Christianstadt, that was our camp, and slept for one night on the floor of the central building, which housed the kitchen and the eating hall of the guards. The next day they moved on. I talked to one of them and still see myself bending over her as she lay on the floor. She looked like exhaustion incarnate. I felt that strange sense of compassion for those who need sleep. And I also felt privileged because as yet I hadn't been forced into that kind of, uh, of exertion. We hoped the Germans would simply abandon the camps and let the advancing Russians take over. But it didn't. They evacuated us. This time we had to walk. We had to all carry our blankets and our metal dish no more. We wore the rags that, our, that were our clothes with a yellow patch that could be covered. Being on the road, we naturally dreamt of escape, but we moved in the wrong direction, away from the front. We dragged ourselves along the road through the villages, slowly and on the edge of total exhaustion. Then I, at, at that first night, this s men who were now in charge, commandeered a few barns for us to sleep in. I had a very modest notion of what I needed by way of space and comfort for a good night's sleep. But in this barn, there wasn't enough room, not even for my limited requirements. We lay so close to each other that you couldn't get out to pee. We had tin cans, and the place soon stank. I had had plenty of practice in living and lying down in unnatural proximity to others. But this night in the barn surpassed my adaptability, perhaps in part because the women were so burnt out, so close to cracking up. They disgusted and appalled me. Suddenly, they were not my people anymore. I've had enough. I won't, cannot take anymore. Next morning, our trek continued. And then, in the evening, we acted. On the second night, we took off during the chaos of being herded into yet another container. It was again a village with barns, but this time, if I recall correctly, our keepers could requisition one barn only, because the owners were unwilling to have us. I still see the place, some light coming from the buildings, semi-darkness in the crowd, which patiently waits for the next command, darkness and silence a bit further on. As I stood there, the last spark of energy seemed gone, and nausea, the prospect of a second night like the last, was a lump in my throat. And then there was the lure which arose from the surrounding land. In spite of the cold of that February, there was the promise of spring in the air, a seduction I felt every February since that time. February is purgatory time. There was a stillness, a type of security which didn't quite reach us and yet seemed to be within reach. You could feel it nearly a few steps from the misery of the camps which we carried with us on our backs with the blanket and the yellow patch. patch. Out there was the breath of nature, organic, silent. Now, let's go, this moment. My mother wanted to wait for the next bread ration. 
I contradicted her bitterly, desperately. They're hardly giving us any food anyway. We can find this much on our own. Now or never, no one is watching. They're occupied, they're likely to be tired. Not another night in one of those dreadful barns. Three young Czech women were of the same opinion. My friend Susie sided with me, persuaded by me. My mother still hesitates, then agrees, albeit reluctantly, yes. I believe the farm at which we were supposed to spend the night was on a small elevation. Or perhaps it seemed so, because now our movements were so fast and light, downhill as it were. As the last spark of energy blossomed into a firework in my head, we six turned on our heels and ran down the street. During the next minutes, as we ran away from the freezing, hungry prisoners and their enforced wait for shelter, we passed the barrier from the world of the camps into Germany. Of course, the concentration camps were, with, were within the German Reich, and their brand name would forever bear the label made in Germany. But they were, or seemed to me, encased in a capsule we had shattered. We were free, free to be hunted down if our luck should turn. But I remember only the exuberance, the euphoria of these moments. Leaden fatigue and physical weakness had turned into the opposite. I felt an enormous burst of energy and wondered while running whether I had really been as exhausted as I had imagined. How come I'm suddenly moving so fast when I thought I was incapable of another step? It seemed a miracle then. Today I know that this miracle goes by the simple chemical name of adrenaline. Uh, can I read one more? section or yeah okay then I'll just skip to the end of this and read the bit a bit that I added to the English version uh, I added a lot here and there but this this I added to the English version uh, Mr. Marcuse told you that I didn't want to finish this to, to have this book out in English while my mother was alive and so I added a couple of pages about her death In Los Angeles, they put the simple Jewish pine coffee. She died in the year 2000, two years ago, just about two years ago. In Los Angeles, they put the simple Jewish pine coffin into a hideous cement cast before the ledger buried. Some health regulation from some department where they figure the dead pollute the earth. Dead humans, that is. Dead animals don't have to be packed in cement. Maybe the dead do pollute the earth, but if so, no amount of man-made material will stop them from it. My mother looked small and shriveled in the hours I sat with her after she had died, not so much peaceful as spent. Life had drained out of her in those last days, and she just wanted to be left alone. I regret making her sit up and drink orange juice, or cajoling her to come to the table to have some decaf and toast. She didn't want to. It was as if she was saying, I've put up with all of you for nearly a century, and now I want to be left in peace. It was a good death, as they say, for she was in her own home, her own bed, still able to move, and she even dragged herself to the toilet half an hour before she died. She was able to do that, a rare thing for a dying person. But I think there's no such thing as a good death, because her body didn't obey her anymore. Her mind was elsewhere or nowhere, and she was in a state of discomfort that I can only guess at. Not pain, but perhaps worse than pain, who knows? Her mind had been going steadily, leaving her behind, as it were, the same way that her eyesight and her sense of orientation and balance left her. Consciousness flitted in and out. She would snap too, and then again there would be only a flicker. Dying, I came to understand, is a drawn-out process, even if you're not in acute pain or in a coma. The thing that says I gradually steals away. In the afternoon when she ceased to breathe, she was only a little more dead than she had been at noon when I saw her last. And for weeks, for weeks her soul, if that's what it is, had been coming and going in a dilapidated body so that she would stumble and mistake and ignore and recognize and turn towards and turn away. When the men came to take her out of the house and I saw her shrunken body for the last time, for at the funeral the coffin was sealed, I felt a sense of triumph, because this had been a human death, because she had survived and outlived the evil times, and had died in her own good time almost a hundred years after she was born. And then again, I felt she had died like an old cat. In the end, 
they just lie around and sleep mostly. They get up for water and a bit of food and they drag themselves to their sandboxes. For the rest, they are nearly blind, rather sweet, and have a variety of ailments. Both she and I had owned such cats. I had sworn I would do everything in my power to prevent her from dying in the hospital because to her all of them were concentration camps. And I found a helpful doctor and succeeded. Her paranoia caused her to dismiss cleaning women and caretakers. Once she put a new lock on the door because she feared a break-in from a capable and trustworthy household help she just fired. She suspected her older grandson, my son, of wanting to turn her out of her house. I would, sh I would shout at her, my children aren't criminals. She mistrusted her neighbors who liked her, and her doctor, a native Pakistani who treated her with his culture's respect for the old, and all authorities. She was afraid of being deported because she had pretended to be six years younger. I would remonstrate, you saved them six years of Social Security and Medicare. They'll give you a medal if they find out. <laughs> As her mind became more unreliable, she mercifully returned to her childhood in the little Czech village she came from where her father was the important director of the local sugar refinery. I would take her out to lunch, and she'd refuse at first because she thought she had to go to school. When I assured her she didn't, her face would brighten because she thought she had permission to play hooky. She would order cream of broccoli soup, fried shrimp, and blintzes. To the, to the end, she loved to go for a ride and would exclaim at the beauty of the trees and the size of the buildings. She commented on the color of the cars and the color of the traffic lights and was pleased as a toddler when she could coordinate green and red cars with lights. During her last weeks and months, all memory of the Nazis seemed to be gone. She was back with her playmates on the Czech meadows of her first years. She had a pet goat and a cart pulled by the goat and was happy. There were the village children, the fields and the animals, a doting father, bare feet. None of her own generation was at the funeral. She had outlived them. But her last great love was there. My grandchild, Isabella, a little girl of four. Isabella had known her great-grandmother as someone who was in many ways on her level, and she wasn't faced by a face that was scary to many children because it was as wrinkled as a mask, like a witch's. Little Isabella recognized the childlike spirit behind the mask and invented games and jokes for the old lady and cuddled and loved her. My mother's weak eyes would shine when the child entered. As soon as she could walk, she'd toddle up to her with a bowl of fruit as an offering, and my mother would exclaim, and wonder, kind. Outside, they would walk hand in hand, neither of them all that steady on their feet, though for opposite reasons. In a restaurant, Isabella would feed my mother as if she was a doll, and my mother obediently opened her mouth for a spoonful of chocolate pudding. At home, they sometimes threw food at each other, giggling with my son, Isabella's father, commenting, it's disgusting, but who cares? <laughs> Isabella was also friends with my mother's cat. Her own mother had taught her to sign before she could speak, and Isabella would make the sign of the cat an indication of whiskers when she came in the door for a visit. Then the cat died, and we had to explain the inexplicable, and Isabella would continue to sign for the cat even after there was no more cat, and she could say the word cat but there's no sign for a dead great-grandmother. Isabella was profoundly startled when she heard that she wouldn't see her grandma Alma again. Strange as it seems, she had lost a favorite playmate and didn't understand how it could have happened. At the funeral, she stared at the unfamiliar surroundings, frightened and unhappy, dry eyes wide open, having sustained a genuine loss, the first in her life of less than four years. She was beginning to understand the terror of time, the invisible thief with the force of a hurricane. I gave her some bric-a-brac from my mother's house, which she gladly and solemnly accepted, and a flower to throw into the grave, though this cement casing spoiled the effect of the traditional gesture. I look at the snapshot of the two of them gleefully rubbing noses, a smile of total affinity on both their faces, the girl who will be a woman of the 21st century, and the woman who was a girl in the early 1900s, sharing some genes, sharing affection. On one side, the child whose mind hadn't reached maturity. On the other, the old adult who had once lost a teenage son to anonymous murderers and whose mind had gone beyond ripeness. More than 90 years between them, but whenever they were together, chatting and touching, 
They met in a present that miraculously stood still for them, time frozen in space, and space made human, perhaps redeemed. Thank you. Oh, there's someone with a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, in one chapter, you described in Theorizenstadt that um, um, there's a feeling of being like scum of, of the earth. Um, I, I can't hear you. There's a feeling of being very self-critical, a feeling kind of like very low. You use the terms uh, scum of the earth. Maybe that was... I, I can't hear you. In one chapter, you describe a feeling uh, of being very low as if you were scum of the earth. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. What I just read, yeah? And in the in a chapter before that, you described um, um, this feeling of community. That yes, that's right. Uh, is there a way? I don't know if this is. Oh a, well, a that's. Good I, I was uh, actually, you know, I like that passage. That's why I read it. Uh, when I started thinking about this time at Wiesenstadt, it was. Uh, on the one hand and on the other hand. And I, I started writing this the way one writes these, uh, uh, <laughs> these the way one makes these balanced statements. On the one hand, I, I, I had, I've had a lot of friends, and on the other hand, it was really dreadful because we were starving and so on. And we were, people were constantly being deported and, and it was crowded. And then I, I decided to do it the way I did it, it what you heard, that, that I would do the, 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 the positive and the negative aspects of these uh, times for me. I would do them uh, energetically and fully and not, not go in for this boring on the one hand and on the other hand. Because they are not, uh, they cannot be reconciled. It really is both. You know, there's, uh, the difference is, of course, that I, uh, that I have very good memories of many Jews there, of many prisoners. And the situation in itself was catastrophic. It was a terrible place to be in. Well, how do you reconcile this? You can't. You can only, it's, or it seemed to me that way, you can only present it as a contrast. That, that was the idea, to present, to present a contrast that is supposed to startle. You know, I say, uh, when I start saying I love Theresienstadt and I've been telling a little about what a, what a pretty bad place it was, I, I, the reader is supposed to, to, to say, well, come again, what is this? But then when I add, uh, when I explain, after I've explained it, I, when I suddenly turn and say I hated it, you're supposed to be to have the reaction that you had, to be startled, what's going on here? And then ho hopefully, I mean, if you think about it, you realize that it's, it's, it's a mixed experience. That's what I was trying to write. Does that answer it? Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you for that question, it was a good question. Mm -hmm.